Today we had a big day, and uh, the Holy Father told us, gave us uh, a wonderful speech, and which contains a mission. And but um, what I was struck about was the fact that uh, uh, when he arrived, he didn't go to his chair as he used to do. So I went to many audiences, and uh, of course he always uh, goes to uh, take his chair, to sit there, and then he used to greet people afterwards. But today happened something different. So he went to greet Martin, Helen, and Francesca. So I'm very grateful for you, Helen, and Francesca to have made it and to, to be here with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So your, your work is a great inspiration for all of us. Uh, the people you see here uh, uh, are poets, writers, and uh, from uh, many countries of the world, from uh, uh, America, uh, from Asia, from Africa, and from Europe. And so uh, in front of you, don't, you don't see journalists or other kind of people, <laughs> but uh, people who uh, like your work and like to work um, about creativity and inspiration. So um, our desire, uh, when I ask you if you were able to come over here, is to listen um, your experience. So it's kind of a sharing your experience. So um, it's not going to be a talk, but uh, a question and answer section. So I want to start um, talking about a personal experience. Um, so I wrote a book uh, called Una Trama Divina, a uh, divine plot. And uh, I sent this book to Pope Francis before it was published. And it, it was so, so nice to me. Uh, because he wrote a preface, a wonderful preface. So usually I suggest people to buy this book, not because I, I wrote this book, but because the preface. <laughs> and uh, he quoted this morning. And I found it so in inspiring, and I desired to share it with Martin. And so I sent it to him. Uh, after some days, maybe 10 days or something like that, he answered me saying, uh, I felt very inspired by this preface, and um, I decided to give an answer, mm. uh, to, to say something. Huh? Uh, but I'm not a philosopher, huh? uh, I'm a, um, a director. So what he did was to send me a script um, about a possible movie about Jesus. So I remember that, uh, that very day because um, when I received this email from him, I was in France with a Jesuit friend. That was something like uh, December the 30th or mm -hmm. 31st, mm -hmm. something like that. So I was in vacation. And uh, I started swirling around the room <laughs> and feeling a sense of responsibility myself and pondering what I should do with it. You felt the force of a personal invitation. You had to respond, not with an essay, but as a director. You brought me with a script. You brought me in that email something that captures the eye and the mind in an unexpected, unexpected way. Tell me now, please, what struck you about that call? And what did you feel resonated within you? the call from Pope Francis? Well, I think <clears throat> because I've been uh, so much, uh, the church has been so much uh, part of my life uh, uh, since growing up in the uh, 1940s and 50s, that uh, the very um, uh, question and the very, I should say, uh, suggestion from His Holiness is something that I've been tra grappling with since, so oh, since I was, 13 or 14 years old. This is what I've been grappling with 
my whole life. So I, I can't very much uh, be specific about it, except that whenever I tried to express it in different ways, um, either the people around me were not ready for it or, or accepting of it. Um, what I mean by that is that I wanted the Jesus of now, the immediacy of Jesus here now, not in uh, as beautiful and as uh, as as uh, 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 inspiring as the edifice of a beautiful church or a small basilica or a small chapel is. Uh, uh, the Jesus doesn't only exist there. The Jesus is with us. And how is that expressed? Uh, is it expressed through people towards us, or does change come from within? which is what I believe it does. Change does come from within. You could force it from without, but it comes from within. And that change, for me, is always guided by the concept of Jesus. And so um, I tried for many years to find uh, how Jesus uh, is expressed in, 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 in the world around me, how I thought I was expressing Jesus and was not. <laughs> you know, um, making mess of things. Um, uh, pride, ego, uh, the film director, you know, uh, all of this. So for me, this was suddenly I felt that I could actually try to approach this again more directly as I had tried with Last Temptation of Christ, let's say, or with, uh, to a certain extent, Kundun, but certainly in silence. I think that was the most, that by the time I had done silence, I felt I had had at least begun to grapple with the mystery in the right way. Um, a, personal question. a personal question. Did you ever think about becoming a priest? <laughs> uh, I think so. Well, well I think so. My there wife. are some priests. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think so, because you were in seminary preparatory school. Yes. So if so, why did you desire it? And uh, what did you imagine? Uh, was it to find peace or uh, out of admiration? Or did you feel a calling, a vocation? And then did you leave or were you invited to leave? I, I was invited to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but the, the question is, yeah. being a priest, <laughs> being a priest and being a filmmaker, do these two things have to do with each other? Um, so. Do these two things have to do with uh, each other for uh, your life? Well, for me, the, the big change in my life was, was um, <clears throat> there were several major ones, one of which was living in the Lower East Side of Manhattan uh, on the Italian-American Sicilian neighborhood uh, in the 1940s and all through the 50s and the 60s. This was a very strong uh, experience, say the least, that you could tell if you know some of my films. Uh, uh, my father and mother were one of um, each, each side of the family had seven or eight children, and they were aunts, I had many aunts and uncles. Um, they were born on Elizabeth Street in 1912 and 1913, not in a hospital. And so um, a, I grew up, in a sense, in a very uh, uh, old world, uh, very much the world of the villages uh, outside of Palermo. You know, Chimina and Polizia Generals. Polizia Generals. Yeah, so, so, so in a way, these are, these are the people, and some Neapolitans, maybe some Calabresi, but mainly, <laughs> mainly Neapolitans, Sicilians. So Sicilians, in any event, Sicilians. <laughs> Sicilians. Um, in any event, uh, in New York, that was, you know, it was a rough area. It was a very, very difficult place. Um, it was street, street tough. Very much so. At that time was the American phenomena of the juvenile delinquent, um, uh, war, gang wars, and that sort of thing. But primarily it was, it was um, structured by, uh, by the, the family structure, and the family structure was the unit for decency, really, from my mother and father, from my aunts and uncles, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but around us, we were living in a place that was, uh, one could say, is indecent uh, between uh, the organized crime and also, uh, also the, uh, 
the very end of life for so many men and some women um, on the Bowery. Uh, what you call now homeless, but at that time we would call alcoholics or bums or, you know. Um, and we lived with them. Um, we got to know them. We were frightened of them. We were frightened of everything, basically. But in any event, um, uh, that world uh, was uh, very, very difficult to, uh, for me anyway. I developed serious asthma at the age of three, which almost gave me, and I'll get to the point soon, Almost gave me a, almost gave me a kind of a relief in a way from having to, to prove myself with with uh, fake masculinity, you know, which uh, or, or macho, uh, which I, I I can still kind of admire, but I didn't have to prove myself that way uh, very often. I had, but I had to find a way to use my head, in order to stay alive. Um, there was one other figure uh, around the corner from us was the first Catholic cathedral in New York, and that's the old St. Patrick's, now is the Basilica. I think it was 1812 was built. And so I was thrown into the Catholic school there uh, by my parents. They said, go, go, around the, go around the corner, go to school. And the nuns were Sisters of Mercy, I think. In any event, um, uh, I spent a lot of time in that, in that church. Uh, and at that time, the the pastor and many of the number of the priests were for the old, for the old uh, generation. In fact, they hardly spoke English. It was mainly Italian. So we seemed distanced from them. Then around 1953, a young priest came in. Uh, his name was Francis Principe. And um, he w it was his first parish. And he was 23 years old. And he suddenly brought a whole fresh way of looking at life to us. Uh, he, he, would, he would be very annoyed with me because I wouldn't play any sports. He didn't quite understand that. I was told I couldn't play any sports. If I did, I'd get sick and I wouldn't breathe. But in any event, uh, what he did was represent a way of thinking and a, a way of dealing with life that was very, very different from a kind of harsh, judgmental, cruel world that I was living in. Um, he would look at, uh, look at us and say, you don't have to live like this, you know. And the first thing he gave us was uh, the books of Graham Greene. Um, and we started reading, oh, uh, you know, uh, The Power and the Glory. Uh, the, 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 the best for me was The Heart of the Matter. All of this, the, the essays of Dwight MacDonald, um, which at that time in the early 50s was rather, I then found James Joyce somehow. I don't know, uh, it, it, by the time we did Dubliners and well, primarily Portrait of the Artist. Um, uh, then, at that time, was the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement and sort of stumbled into James Baldwin. I had never really seen African Americans aside from a few that were uh, on the Bowery. I never spoke to one. So this was an opening of the world. He played music for us. He loved cinema. And um, uh, he made sense. He made sense morally because we'd be taught these street lessons by him um, as to right and wrong or ethics. Um, and he counterbalanced the old world in a way and opened us up to a new way of thinking. And so he had such, a, 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 such an effect on me that I realized I couldn't really, um, uh, I couldn't really exist. And the opportunities that were, uh, were open to us in that area mm, weren't very many. One of which was, you, you could be a tough guy, you could be in an organized crime. It wasn't for me. A few of my friends, yes, but it wasn't for me. Uh, you could, after that, what, what, what was there? Uh, Catholic education, which I had at Cardinal Hayes High School. Um, and the world changed when I went to New York University, uh, which at that time, that school was not the way it is now. It was called Washington Square College. And uh, my... my uh, uh, my whole way of thinking was that I found that things were so difficult to deal with in that world, and I saw him as a kind of uh, clarity and also an example of love, um, different from my parents, um, but, but a, a, a very strong example of love, that I wanted to be like him, so I decided I wanted to be a priest. And so for the high school, I went for the first year to 
Cathedral College was a preparatory seminary in, in New York. And within two months, I realized, uh, I was maybe 14, I think, but within two months, I realized uh, it wasn't for me. And um, I became, I stopped studying, I became a clown in class, that sort of thing. But the point was that I began to realize just because you love someone, you want to be with them and be like them, um, you have to have a vocation. A vocation is a serious thing. It's not, oh, I want to be like that person. Uh, it's not that easy. Uh, he would always tell us, in order, to, to, in order to have a vocation, you must love the mass. And I, I didn't know what he meant. I was an altar boy, but I was always late, you know, and they would get mad at me and that sort of thing. So I really, you know, I didn't really understand the, uh, the, uh, this sort of thing. Um, and so that was the first big lesson uh, in which I realized that uh, I was trying to hide by being a priest. I was trying to hide from life, uh, fear, the fear of being hurt, the fear of hurting others. Um, and I thought maybe I could guide uh, instead, one has to have a true love and a true understanding, I think, of the mystery of uh, God's love. One has to be, one really has to, to, to explore that and understand that, that you may not ever get there, but that's what it's all about. Uh, it's like when you make a film, they say, oh, now you've finished the film. Well, not really. It's always here. And they said, gonna, do you see your films again? No. I made them. I'm still making them. I'm still making them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so about this movie, in the script, in the script you, you wrote about um, your idea to make a film, a movie uh, about Jesus. Uh, we published the script on La Civiltà Cattolica on the website, and you can find it in English, of course. You were thinking about a movie uh, about Jesus since the 60s. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Right. Around that time, uh -huh. uh, when, I, when, I was, uh, when I realized the vocation wasn't for me, that it's about others and not myself, you know? not your own salvation. I mean, yes, if you can, but it's about being with others. Once I realized that, that, that there was another passion that was, that was in me, and that was for the moving image, pictures that moved. Stories, really, I should say, not just pictures, stories. They had to go to pictures because in my family, my mother and father were working in the garment district in New York. They never read a book, so there were no books in the house. So I had to bring books in. I had to learn how to read. I had to learn how to live with the book, meaning if the book was more than 200 pages, I had to have learn the patience. Um, and so I learned, I saw, and I experienced everything through the street and the storytellers of the street, hmm. which are wonderful. Uh, the, ones, uh, the ones on the, uh, the uh, street corner, the tough guys telling stories with a great sense of humor about themselves, my mother's storytelling, my father's, my uncle's. I learned all that. And the only way I thought I could express it was through images, pictures, because that's how I grew up seeing art. That and the art in the church. And so um, for me, uh, this quest to, to explore Jesus uh, had to find its way to uh, cinema. And so I had planned to make one in 16 millimeter black and white. This was 1961, I think, or so. And I, by that point, I was at Washington Square College, and I was beginning to take film courses, although this film school idea, it is, they don't show you how to make a film. You can't learn that. Uh, it's really more about the master and the student. We had a very good teacher named uh, Haig Mnugian, who was Armenian-American, and he had a lot of passion for this sort of thing and for me. And so I followed his directions. Uh, he saw something in me. And at that time, I wanted to make the story of Jesus in a uh, modern day uh, in the Lower East Side, um, in the tenements and uh, on the Bowery, uh, culminating in, a, in uh, the crucifixion on the New York City docks, uh, you know, with the West Side Highway, which is no longer there, you know. Um, and then I went to see Pasolini's Gospel according to Matthew. And I realized, can't be done. He's already done it. He's already done it. Um, and uh, Pasolini's film is just uh, great poetry. And um, um, he actually, in that film, uh, because of the style, and the style was the style of the late 50s, early 60s of 
mm, the new cinema, the new French new wave, the Italian new wave, the British new wave, but primarily cinema, um, uh, 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 cinema verite. He made you feel as if you were there. And he, made it, he gave us an immediacy of Jesus, and also a Jesus that was not a movie star. Now, God bless the movie stars who tried to play it. It was a very hard role for Jeffrey Hunter and others who were trying to play that. But um, when you saw this face that you'd never seen before, uh, and all the other faces of the people, and, and Matera, uh, the town of Matera, I, and, and then, of course, the way he portrayed Jesus, all within the Gospel of Matthew, the anger, the strength, the beauty, and the music. The music, and Misa Luba, and even Lead Belly, uh, and of course Bach. And so but this was a great work of art, I thought. And I said, if I ever had to make a film on Jesus, I have to find another way uh, to approach, approach this extraordinary situation. I, I, there, there was no way. So for years I had been intending then to make a film on uh, Life of Christ. But what What do you mean by immediacy of Christ? Well, in the case of um, in the case of uh, if you want to look at film, Pasolini's Christ is the guy. It's not somebody who walks in the room and glows. Mm -hmm. He's there. He's in the yeah, corner. He's there, and he comes over here, and we're all together. It's the one. It's yep. sometimes the one who's in the corner you don't see. You know, the first is last, the last is first, and so that's fascinating to me. Um, the other films that had been made up to that time were at times pageantries and and uh, very 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 um, uh, piously made, which was good, which was good. I mean, you could see it in some of the great paintings, some of the great Michelangelo. They they do have halos, you know. But what Pasolini was able to do was to make the Jesus uh, uh, figure and the others around him, somebody you would know, somebody you could speak with, you know? Um, and uh, this, this, I think, is really key. The immediacy of Jesus, for me, though, is in, the, is in, the, is in the, your own life, is, your, is the people around you, uh, the tests that you have in your own life. Um, and I think, you know, the help of Jesus to get past yourself to deal with others. But despite Pasolini, you did not desist from wanting a movie about Jesus, and out of that desire came The Last Temptation of Christ. Yes. Uh, what's the meaning of that movie? It seems to be a carnal, visceral movie. There seems to be an obsession in it, and something unresolved. So what moved it? Um, were you satisfied with it? And it's interesting to me that although you mention other uh, movies of yours in the script you write, uh, you um, didn't mention that one at all. So well, why? I could answer that first because it's like a button that's pressed with that film. Suddenly, anger and resentment. Let's take that all away. Okay. Let's think about that. Let's say there's a film about a fictional film on Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And this is what he does, and this is what he thinks, and this is what happens. He has to struggle to be the Messiah. He has to want to be the Messiah. And at the end, he is, and this is a beautiful idea by Cousin Zakis, he, the end, he is tempted, not by power or anything, he's tempted to live a normal life. Because what the life God has given us is so beautiful. The life around him, the growing of uh, 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 growing of uh, uh, his, his produce or, or agriculture, uh, the the love of a woman, the, the wife, the children, raising children, the life he gives uh, Jesus as a temptation, as the devil gives Jesus as a temptation, is something that's so beautiful, and it's almost as if God envies the life he gave us humans. And I thought that was so beautiful as an idea, as an idea. Um, the main point, though, for me was that. Um, the misunderstanding of the way Jesus was presented to us in the, in the mid 20th century in, in New York, uh, I can only speak for myself now, and as a child's point of view, um, well, Jesus is on the cross and he dies on the cross for our sins. All right. Well, what does that mean? Um, not sure. Well, he's God, so he could die on the cross. He doesn't have to suffer. You see, this is because he's fully God and fully man. So, The confusion became like, well, if sure, it's easy for Jesus, but what about us? What about us when we suffer? 
you see. What about us when we get angry? What about us when we misunderstand and then years later we realize, oh my God, I've been wrong all along and I have to do repentance, so to speak. Uh, all of these things, and what about fear? What about anger? Well, it's in Jesus too, and in that story, um, I, I'm not talking, speaking for the book, we tried it, we tried in the film. Um, in that story, we, we showed that, um, we try to show that um, the very fact that he was fully human, embracing death is absolutely terrifying. And that's why I had Lazarus's hand almost pull Jesus back into the tomb with him and Willem Dafoe as Jesus pulls back. He gets frightened because he realizes what, what, what he has to go through. Um, and so it, that whole idea of it's easy for Jesus because he's God, well, no, uh, Jesus shows us the way that we can be capable of these things. Um, and so that was one aspect uh, that I wanted to, to get across. Um, there is another, which is that the Jesus that I found fascinating and I found codified um, in the Bible, in the translations, I should say, of the New Testament, mm -hmm. some of the translations, not all, um, uh, one has to understand, too, a little bit more of the, of, the, mm, of the history of that place and that time, the publicans who were tax collectors and what they meant, the prostitutes, all this sort of thing. Uh, well, here's, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees saying, hey, this guy is hanging out and drinking with, uh, he's drinking wine with prostitutes and, and tax collectors. And we don't understand tax collectors to us for younger people, we thought CPAs. You know, people, <laughs> oh, what did you spend? You know? No, these, these, these were not, these were extortionists. These were gangsters. Uh, and so um, he's with the worst kind of people. And he's condemned by it for that. And like I realized when I go, when I did taxi driver, when I grew up on the Bowery, and then I put a lot of those elements in Taxi Driver. And we were on 8th Avenue between 43rd Street, or 49th, 43rd Street and 52nd Street. It was the end, of, the end of civilization there. Just the end of civilization. And that's where Jesus is. That's the film I wanted to make for them who say, I'm a drunk, I'm a drug addict, I'm a prostitute, I'm this, I'm that, I'm mean, I'm, I have no heart. I am nothing in my life. I don't deserve to be loved. And that's the Jesus I wanted, and that, uh, that's why Last Temptation was presented that way. Uh, talking about another movie uh, I really was struck by, uh, the movie Silence. Mm. Silence. Uh, what did silence mean to you? I found it a deeply spiritual film. Did, you, did it have an impact? on your life, I mean both in uh, thinking about it, but also in making it, and then maybe after making it, did it leave an inner trace in you? Uh, if so, of what kind? And uh, again, in your opinion, is it a step forward from Last Temptation uh, of <laughs> Christ, and in, in, in what direction? Yes, I think it's important because as we were doing Temptation, which was an extremely difficult film to make, there's very little money to make it, um, I had uh, uh, touched upon all the um, um, iconography of the church, which is uh, the crowning of thorns, the, all of this, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, everything, uh, but primarily the crucifixion. And we're, we're under duress all the time, uh, just great pressure. And when the film was finished, or never really was quite finished because it was an outcry at the time and we had to release the film unfinished, but it, it, it became more than a movie, so it's not really a movie in a way. Um, I realized that um, I had to go further into the story of Jesus, or not the story, but the concept. I had to explore further because maybe there was a part of me that was, prime, there was a part of me that had to create this um, crucifixion that had to create uh, the raising of Lazarus, that had to make my versions, but that's not the story of Jesus, you see. And so I found that by getting all this done, um, I wasn't really closer, even though I felt so strong, I felt the presence of Jesus with me. You could say, oh, ego egomaniac, but under the circumstances, uh, it was so difficult in the desert, and we were just driven, all of us, I felt it. But I didn't get there. I didn't get there. And the night that the film was shown um, to the uh, 
to the different uh, religious groups, um, there was a little dinner around the corner in a hotel, and the only uh, uh, friend of mine, Father uh, John Keenan, we were in the seminary together, he was there, and uh, Archbishop Paul Moore and his wife, the Episcopal Church in New York, he, he showed up, he said, because the film was Christologically correct. And so we sat down and he told us stories about himself and his life, uh, having been in the war and uh, what he changed uh, uh, from the war experience. Uh, and this is for me too, right? I'm talking about my own sensitivity in the Lower East Side and wise guys and, and uh, alcoholics and this sort of thing. There's nothing compared to what people go through in a war experience, you know? So, but that's all I know. And I know that that's how I reacted. But he, he said, I'm gonna give you a book, it's called Silence. And, um, uh, and he described some of it to me. And um, that was 1988. Um, I held on to the book and took it with me to Japan in 89. After I, I had to make Goodfellas because I owed them a film. And they, <laughs> they let me go to make Last Temptation in Hollywood because all the studio heads knew how much I wanted to make it and I was driving them crazy and it was it just, anyway, they made it all work, those guys. It was quite something. Uh, to see different studio heads come together and say, all right, well, we'll forgive that debt, we'll move that over here, and go ahead and do that, but when you come back, make, finish this film. And it was Goodfellas. And on the last days of shooting Goodfellas, Akira Kurosawa was waiting for me mm. to be in his movie, to play Van Gogh. And uh, I was late, and he was 82 years old, and he was waiting. Mm. Mm, Japan, yeah. And so, we had to get there, and I took the book with me, and that's where I read the book, and that's when I realized when the moment of um, Jesus' voice saying, you know, uh, step on me. Uh, that moment for me was so overwhelming. It was on the bullet train, I remember, and I said, I have to make this. There was only one major problem that I didn't understand yet. I don't know if I still do, but I didn't see a way but I knew, I knew that I had to pursue this. And that began a 20 some odd year uh, uh, odyssey of, of uh, different producers, different people uh, trying to write the script and trying to understand uh, I exactly what Endo was going for at that point and what Rodriguez went through and uh, Garupe and, and all of them. Um, and the whole concept, but also I had to learn more about um, Japan's history and more about uh, the Jesuits in Japan. So there was a lot to do. I think I started writing the script a little too soon and uh, we got stuck on certain scenes and I put it away, I suddenly put it away and I went off and made some other films. And I think it was around 2008 or nine, I think when finally I, I laid it out on the page in terms of construction. Um, and uh, uh, was able to uh, convince my friend Jay Cox to come in with me and ultimately write the script. And we finally got the draft I liked. Uh, the problem then was uh, the legal issues. There were so many different producers and people who had claims on it, and it took another four or five years or so for uh, old, some old friends of mine to, uh, to try to uh, undo the damage that was done, like the Gordian Knot in a way of undoing these things. That's why you see so many producers on that film. It doesn't, they, they did do something, but, but primarily it's because they stayed with the film for three years and they didn't do it. Then another two years and they didn't do it. But in any event, all of that was uh, about trying to, to understand what, not if I understand, but to come to terms with what Rodriguez did. Yeah. And mm -hmm. All of that building that at one moment. And so um, I know that when we went to Taiwan to shoot the film, it was Ang Lee who sent us to Taiwan. Mm. You know, the director, he's a great director, and he, and he said, you go there, man, we have everything. And we used Hao Xiaoshan's sets, and we, uh, we, it was an extra, but the film, the making of the film had an, imp had an impact on everybody on the crew. Everybody on the crew. Um, it, it was, a, a, Difficult shoot. I thought Temptation was difficult. This was even harder. But um, I never saw people work so hard and with smiles uh, under 
earthquakes and typhoons and the seasons for the Taiwanese cobra, which apparently they have a season. <laughs> Which they didn't, they didn't tell me about, but it's okay. You don't have to, you go to Taiwan, it's all right. Um, but in any event, it was, it was a uh, shooting in a typhoon was extraordinary. Um, and the Japanese actors, hmm. the Japanese, the ones who got on the crosses with the water hitting them. This was, I never, they insisted on staying up there. I said, no, no, come down. <laughs> no, I do more shots for you, you know? Um, and these were remarkable, remarkable actors. Um, but we, I get very excited about that particular film. It was a very beautiful experience with Andrew Garfield and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Adam Driver, you know. And so um, uh, that, became, that became, by the time that night when we shot that scene where Andrew Garfield has to step on the Fumi, the stunt people were upside down in, in the pits. But, you know, it was very difficult for them. Uh, and it was around five in the morning. And as soon as he steps on the Fumi, we hear the cock crow for real. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, you know, wow. we're chilled. Uh, and, you know, and when he did it, Andrew did it so beautifully. And, uh, oh, you know, the uh, Issei Yagata up there as Inui, it, it was something that no one will ever forget. It was five, then six in the morning, we all stumbled home you know, to the hotel. But um, I think for me, I, I had so much in my head about silence and so much about the missionary work uh, at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not an authority on it, but it's a matter of, uh, in a way, the way I saw the behavior or the example that Jesus gives, the example, let's say, that Father Principe gave me, most of the time. Um, maybe this is the way to go about missionary work. Hmm. You say, I want to be like that person. Well, that person is, I want to be like that person. If she did that, when I was sick, they stayed in the room. They didn't leave, you know? Well, why is that person that way? And then you find a little more, you find a little more. And if you, you say, well, this person has faith of a certain kind, you might be more interested, you might understand. Um, but I, I think that's probably, um, probably one of the things that Rodriguez felt that this may not be the way to, to deal with Jesus in another culture. But, but Ari Aster, um, commenting on silence, said that just by denying God, Kijihiro became a true Christian. Do you agree with that? No, Why? I think he, he, he may have simplified that. I think it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> because um, what, what I, he, he is very articulate on the film. Um, and Ari is a unique filmmaker. His latest film, Bo is Afraid, is three hour, hilarious Kafka ass nightmare. I mean, just madness. Uh, but again, taking chances, you know. But Ari, I think, is talking about the fact that in giving up is when you get it. In giving it up and saying, I'm not going to crush it, I'm not going to hold on to it anymore. And it goes, and suddenly is when you receive the grace. And I think that's what happens with Rodriguez. And I think that's what Rodriguez realizes. I embrace the mystery of life and death, which is what Jesus is. It's the great mystery. And the beauty, of, we'll never know the end of it. You know, we're just not going to know. But in the process of living it, you embrace it and you, you know, try to do something that, I mean, if you're lucky enough to be able to create something, if you call it art, that, that's a gift. It's a gift. And it was the same, St. Augustine said, right, the uh, art is, is beautiful because it reflects God, in a way. Any kind of creation, it really does. Um, and the more, through art, is where you learn about the other cultures and all of this, but it really is an attempt for us to make sense of our existence, right? You, I don't have to tell you, you know that. So, um, uh, for me, Rodriguez realizes, no, it's the embrace. It's the embrace of the mystery. It's the embrace of the people around me. They don't have to die on the cross. They simply don't, even though there are many who say, no, they're the real heroes of the film. Yes, I understand that. Um, and uh, there's been some criticism about the film that um, uh, filmmakers are more like a, there's a phrase they use now called cultural elite, where we take, oh, we'll take that from Catholicism or that, or that from Buddhism. I, I'm not going there. 
I mean, I mean it. When he, when he stepped on that Fumi, he stepped on it, and he knew what he was doing. And one, the first night in Rome, when the film was shown of a group of Jesuits, the first question I got was, would you do that? Would you step on it? And I said, well, if Jesus told me, if I heard Jesus tell me to step on it, I'd step on it, because Rodriguez heard Jesus. Well, maybe it was, we don't know, he heard Jesus. And so for me, all of these questions come together, and uh, I think ultimately uh, uh, it, it's a very special attempt at, a, at an understanding. I don't know if it's a successful movie, but it's an attempt at an understanding. Huge, huge movie. Wow. Uh, again, about Jesus. Um, in the script you wrote after reading the preface written by Pope Francis, uh, you wrote, Jesus contains multitudes. And that sounds like a quote from... Well, Bob. it's Walt Whitman. Bob, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bob well, Dylan. Bob Dylan, and, too. Come on. And <laughs> Walt Whitman. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, but what do you mean by that? So, in what sense does Jesus contain multitudes? Which kind of multitude? I think it's pretty obvious. I think it's, it's the multitudes of, of, of humanity. And it's mm. Jesus showing us, giving us a direction, showing us the way, the way to be able to live. And I mean that in, um, mm, to deal with um, anger and revenge and retribution and love and forgiveness, all of that together. And he shows us the way. It's not easy, as we all know, but um, uh, he is the example and I think is the example for the multitudes because he is all of us. That's what he I see. All of us. He is all of us. Um, we are many things. Yes. Uh, there is good and bad. There is, uh, there is also violence in us. Yes. And there are a lot of violence in your movies. Yes. Yeah. And uh, in her book, Absence of Mind, Marilyn Robinson wrote, we are brilliantly creative and equally brilliantly destructive. So this makes human being inexplicable. And you seem to want to stage real, not uh, artificial, grotesque violence. So why? What does violence teach us? Which, is, which was your experience of violence? Well, and uh, violence... Does violence uh, teach us something? And it, it, if anything, if anything, I, I grew up in a very violent place, mm. um, and that um, it just was, in uh, the way many people growing up now in a very violent place. I'm not only talking about the obvious wars that are going on. I'm talking about in neighborhoods and areas where now in America everybody has a gun. Never did I ever think that mm. such a thing would happen. You know. Uh, and so it's an extraordinarily violent, uh, violent life. Um, the violence I saw around me, the violence I experienced, uh, sometimes was um, overshadowed by the emotional violence, where there was no physical violence, but the emotional violence was even more terrifying. But the thing about violence, to me, two, two aspects. One, the major point is who we are, the human condition, to deny it, it will only prolong uh, a bad reckoning with violence to deny it. You must face it. You must understand that it's in us, in our human nature, um, in our uh, very, very human nature. There might be many people who are very sweet and have not one aspect of it. I don't know. I'm speaking from my own experience and a lot of people I know. Um, to understand that and then to overcome that and not to be ashamed of it, this is the key. Uh, it was one time a, a Tibetan monk once told me uh, 20 years ago, he said, oh, I saw your film. Uh, we were in Washington with the Dalai Lama. He said, I saw your film, Gangs in New York. I said, oh, mm -hmm. see, I said, I said ah, it's a little violent. He goes, no, 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 it's, don't, be, don't be upset. He says, it's your nature. <laughs> <laughs> I was suddenly very moved. <laughs> yeah, well, it's maybe my nature. All right, well, then I have to deal with that if that's my nature. And we have to know we're capable of it. Um, uh, there was a, a great writer who recently saw Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, and Killers of the Flower Moon, which is the new film we finished, uh, we showed at Cannes, 
Um, there's a concentrated effort to pretty much kill off all the Osage Native Americans for their oil money. And not just by guns or bad liquor, but marrying the women and then letting or helping the women to die. So you inherit, see. This was 1921, 22. And um, at one point, I, I was talking to this writer, a famous man. I said, uh, I can't understand how anybody could do this. He said, like, anybody could marry this woman, be in love with her, and it's a true story. She in love with him, have children together, and he's helping poison her. And I said, I can't imagine anybody. He said, well, if anyone could do it, then we're all capable of it. And this is frightening. And uh, he's a remarkable man who said this too, but I don't want to give away his, I don't want to give away the confidence. But the point is to understand the violence. So if you if you make violence exciting or um, what's the word uh, uh, expressionistic in a way, it could be quite beautiful, like the Wild Bunch, Sam Peckinpah, you know. Um, but if you make violence uh, fake, I don't know any other way to shoot it except what I saw. Uh, you know. Um, there is another element um, uh, to show the ugliness of it and the awkwardness of it. Uh, I learned that sometimes about watching some of the Fassbinder films years ago and just growing up in the Bowery where I was. Uh, but there was another element too which is even more troubling and that is growing up in that area and my own nature, as the monk said, you know, my own attraction to violence and being excited by violence. So this is something we have to understand and face that in ourselves too. Um, and we have to know that truth about ourselves. Um, it, it, there's the sparks of it, you know. Because in the neighborhood, in the old neighborhood, the fights in the street, there was this, there was something very exciting, you know. But then there were killings. I didn't witness any, but I know the people who were killed. And um, it wasn't pleasant, you know. And it wasn't funny and it wasn't exciting, I can tell you that. So violence for me can't be, uh, you could have a beautifully choreographed, like what uh, sometimes the great Chinese director Zhang Yimou would do, or uh, as I say, Peckinpah and others, or Wong Kar Wai, and do incredible violence sequence, but that's ballet. It's, you know, it's ballet, it's, it's uh, fantastic. It's ballet. You know how these guys, uh, men and women do this stuff, I don't know. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, and, and, but it does distance you, there's no doubt. I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm saying that I feel distanced from them. But when you get the impact of, or you're going back to, uh, even John Ford had it, but uh, uh, Sam Fuller, uh, some of Sam Fuller's films, but you know, he really had, the power of Fuller's movies was about the emotional violence that he had in, in every frame. You could feel it, it was gonna explode any second. Um, and then later on, at the same time as watching Sam Frollo's films, I'm watching uh, the Italian near realist films. Um, I'm watching Europa, well, we finally found a good copy of Europa 51. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Francesco, Just, you know, the Little Flowers of St. Francis. Mm -hmm. So violence for me, I find that, especially in America now, by distancing oneself from it, it's worse. I think we have to be understand and embrace the violence in ourselves and our association with it. Um, it's not an easy time to have faith in God, in God's love. Uh, Paul Francis uh, preaches a God who is mercy, whose name is mercy. Uh, you once told me in an interview we made years ago that uh, when you were an altar boy going out on the street after mass ended, you wondered how is it possible that life goes on as if nothing has happened that right after Mass? Yes. And why has nothing changed? Why is the world not being shaken by the body and blood of Christ? Mm -hmm. These were your, mm -hmm. your questions. Mm -hmm. You told me that. Mm -hmm. So do you have hope that people today can still feel his presence? And what is mercy to you? I, I do think that once I was... I was so taken by that as a young person, and I do realize that in the beginning of Mean Streets, where uh, Harvey Keitel says, you don't make up for your sins, uh, meaning you don't live life, you don't lead a, a, a Catholic or Christian life, uh, in, you don't make up for your sins in church. You do it in the streets, you do it at home, and the rest is nonsense, you know? Um, and so 
uh, in a way, uh, the transubstantiation isn't only in, in the building. It has to resonate throughout the rest of the world, you see. Uh, in order to do that, we have, we have to be responsible for some of that ourselves. It's how we act, having experienced the transubstantiation in church. To take Jesus and to take God out of the, 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 the church, in a sense, into the streets and into the home, most of all. Um, and as uh, this for me is, is the reality. Do I, do, have I succeeded in my own life? I don't know. I don't think so. I'm 80 years old now. I don't know. But um, I found that at that time, that was, the, that was the main task because I saw things happening all week, craziness, craziness. Then we all show up at the 1230 mass on Sunday. You know, it's like, it's like one of the wise guys um, on Mott Street, an old man, an older guy at that time, not, not older for us at the time, we were in our teens, but he was a great thief and he would go and pray to God to give him strength to steal some more. <laughs> Something not quite right, but <laughs> but this is where I came from. Yes. So I said, no, 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 you shouldn't be praying for that. <laughs> it's the other way. And so, um, uh, but this is the reality of the desperation mm -hmm. of life for some people. So for me, um, uh, I do think the resonance of the transubstantiation has to be outside the church. It really does, and the laity is so important now in the church to take part in it. Um, and the, 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 we, we see the two words now constantly, justice and mercy, justice and mercy. I wonder why mercy shouldn't be first. Mm. I, know, I know because justice becomes, it's a cry for blood, it's retribution, and more and more and more until they're all dead. And somehow it's got to stop at some point. My last question, uh, <laughs> please, <laughs> my last question. Uh, well, time flies, but I would like to stay with you for hours <laughs> and hours, and I think all of us here. But the last questions. Um, what's God grace to you? We, we spoke about grace many times when uh, we, we met, and I learned a lot from you, I have to say, I have to admit. How do you experience the grace of God? It's a, that's a hard question. I mean, maybe as you said, you've learned from me. I, I, didn't, I didn't teach, I was just talking. No, talking. You know, I don't have a theological background that way, and I, I just don't. But I do know that um, the more um, denial and the more rejection I got was a form of grace. To begin again and begin again and begin again, even to the point where at one point I was almost dead uh, in a hospital, and uh, somehow, uh, somehow I made it through. I remember telling the story to uh, a Native American kind of a poet, philosopher, medicine man in 1980 in L.A. He was blind. His name was Storm, and he looked at me and he said. In that hospital, you died. You are now resurrected. He was right. He was right. Prior to that, um, the grace that night that I was in that car in 1963 in November, two weeks before Kennedy got killed, um, in a car, uh, in my neighborhood didn't have cars. People, you don't have cars. Uh, it was too congested. But there was a young guy who came around. He was a, a off-duty cop. He was, and he, he behaved. Uh, brashly, he had a gun with him. You never showed guns in those places. You never wore a gun. You never, because it was very dangerous. But he was a he had his cop thing and he had his gun. But he had a car, um, a uh, uh, convertible, and we were so bored. So and he was behaving. I must say, he was behaving uh, boorishly. But we we put up with. Well, he's got a car. Maybe he'll take us for coffee somewhere. We get out of here. We go to we go to uh, upstate or something to get some coffee. Come back. At least it's something. And I'm, don't forget, I was still at that time at New York University. I'm trying to read Henry James. I, <laughs> you know, I'm trying. To, it's like a split because I was living with my parents uh, on Elizabeth Street. So we get in the car. We go with him around. There's lots of activities in the street that night. Lots of drinking in the clubs. Uh, the after-hours clubs, the illegal clubs, 
And um, he had a friend of his in the front seat. And I think it was one in the morning and we we're about to, uh, he, it was dark in those days in 63. There were no lights in the doorways of the city, uh, any of the buildings. Uh, years later, in 65, 66, they had to be, so everything was very dark. So myself and my friend Joe were sitting in the back seat and we get in the car, but bottom line, um, he gets into an altercation with some people in front of him. Uh, the car wouldn't move, he got out. They were arguing, came back, came back. He showed his gun, he showed his police thing to them, move your car. They said, okay, and they moved the car. So my friend Joe and I looked at each other, this is too much. This is too much, the guy's acting like a fool. I said, well, let's go home, it's two o'clock in the morning. I said, yeah. So we said, good night, good night, we went home. They drove off, within five minutes they were shot. Uh, on Astor Place, where the cube is, if you know it. Bullets, and the kid in the front got his eye shot out. And the next morning, I didn't know, the next morning my friend Joe saw me and he said, uh, borrowed time. Nobody knows we were in that car. Thank God we got out. You know, why? Why did that happen? We would have been killed. You know, or at least greatly maimed, to say the least. Um, and so from that moment on, it was something that around the same time as knowing Father Principe, at the same time as NYU, at the same time as being open to cinema, and all the great new cinema that was being made that could be made now with easier equipment, lighter equipment, all this was a way out. And there seemed to be some kind of, um, um, a kind of uh, a guide or a demand for me to do something. And I, I poured what I felt in terms of my questioning and my, my um, search for uh, Jesus, for, for, uh, uh, for my love for the church and all that, into the creation of um, films, in a way. And somehow, all the themes, Mean Streets, Raging Bull, uh, Casino even, yes, yeah. you know, they all deal with these, these things. I just happened to make a career of films that, for the most part, I really, really, really wanted to make. Which, um, uh, that, you know, that, that's a trade-off. You don't get the Oscars, you don't get the, you know, you get a lot of recognition, but, uh, uh, but you also have to put up with the periods in which you are what they call in Hollywood, washed up. And you come back, the grace to be rejected the grace to be despised. And you say, okay, now look, I'm gonna start again, okay? <laughs> and we go in and we try it again. Um, in the same way that Mean Streets to, um, mean streets to Last Temptation to Kundun to Silence, to the Irishman, even the Irishman, yes. you know? And one last thing, it's interesting about uh, love and um, the depth of understanding of people, particularly who are violent. There was a, a very actually interesting review in a, a British, uh, the British uh, Literary Supplement, which is uh, quite good, I enjoy it. Um, but one element in the review of the film bothered me, and, um, or actually didn't bother me, I said, it's interesting that he sees it this way. And the, the, the reviewer, or the, the writer, he's a very good writer, this man, um, said, uh, yes, I, love, I like this, I like that about the film, et cetera, et cetera. But since when do gangsters worry about their souls? Uh -huh. so that's the whole point. <laughs> that's the whole point. The point is that this, that's human beings. This is who we are. You know, it, I, I understand what he means. I, I get it. I get it. But, but it was so dismiss, oh, dismissive of a whole swath, swathe of, of humanity. You know, say, oh, they're just gangsters. They're just drug addicts. They're just, no. They say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.